Okay. So if everybody's good, we can go ahead and get started, if that works. Is that good, Ben? So good afternoon, everybody. I'm gonna go ahead and call things to order. Um, I'll read our statement very quickly. Due to the governor's recent order, all members of the Public Assembly Facilities Commission are participating virtually. For virtual meetings, commission members will be muted until asked to be heard. At that time, they will be recognized and will be unmuted. When there's a vote, it will be necessary to take a roll call vote. A commission member will be recognized and will raise their hand and state their vote. Today's meeting is a public meeting through the notice posted on July 16, 2020. Citizens can listen to the meeting if they, have contact, if they have contacted the city manager's office to make the necessary arrangements. The meeting also will be live streamed on the city's YouTube channel, which can be accessed at the City of WS website. A recording of today's meeting will be available on Friday, July 24th on the city's website, cityofws.org. Thank you everyone for coming today. We'll go ahead and do a roll call. Rachel, please. All right, Jill. Haley. Present. Otis. Present. Billy. Present. Jim. Here. Maria. Here. Present. Kathleen. And Vicki. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. We'll go ahead and move to the approval of the minutes from the June 15th meeting. Could I have a motion from one of the commission members to accept the minutes? You're on mute, Billy. I move approval. Second, Zotus. A motion has been made and seconded. Is there any question? Favor, there will be a roll call for this. Haley. Aye. Jim. Aye. Billy. Billy. Aye. Otis. Aye. Manya. Aye. Oh, Mary. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you all for that vote. We will move forward with the presentation of restricted opening plan for the Carolina Classic Fair. Okay, before I uh, turn it over to Robert, uh, good afternoon, Chair Jingles and members of the Public Facility Commission. Um, just wanted to kind of tell you where we are uh, in all this in the, in the plan discussions. I mean, as, as you all know, last Tuesday, the governor announced that he would continue phase two of the of his reopening plan through August 7th. Uh, so that still restricts mass gatherings to no more than 25. Uh, we also know that the school system announced that it's going to uh, virtual learning for the first nine weeks of the year so there will not be any uh, in-person learning there uh, we also know that the that the numbers with the first county uh, from the forsyth county health department uh, shows still a, a a significant number of new cases every day uh, we know what's happening across the state and so uh, <clears throat> i just wanted to share that with you all that uh, i mean right now i would say that, that for the prospects for moving forward with the fair uh, are looking uh, not favorable to us. And uh, we haven't made a decision yet on whether we would uh, uh, cancel the fair, but we are looking very closely at the numbers. We are looking at, at the policies that are going into place. We know that earlier this month that the Mountain State Fair up in Fletcher canceled uh, its fair, which was going to be held, I think the second week, in, uh, first or second week in September. Um, so, you know, we know the discussions that are going on out there as far as uh, certainly mass gathering events. Racing's been canceled this year. CIAA has canceled fall football. So whatever decisions ultimately made is going to be made in the, in the context of, of what's going on right now and what we feel like is, you know, in the best interest of public health and, and public safety. Uh, we're not looking to the Public Assembly Facility Commission to make a formal recommendation or formal decision today 
we are looking for you all to advise us, you know, first and foremost, first question, do you think that, you know, uh, we should still be considering the fair, uh, putting on the fair, and then secondly, to give us feedback on uh, the restricted opening plan that staff has worked extremely hard to put together. Uh, they presented the restricted opening plan to the fair planning committee last week, and I got a lot of really good uh, feedback from them, a lot of really good questions uh, that I think we have to continue to, to, to uh, think through if we decide to move forward with the fair. So we're looking to, to you to advise us today, uh, but I, would, I, but I anticipate that uh, you know, we will, you know, when I say we, I mean that probably city management in consultation with the city mayor and the city council will be you know, making a decision you know, here in, uh, sooner rather than, than later regarding you know, the, the, the fair for this year. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Robert. Thanks, Ben. Uh, thanks, Chair Jingles and me uh, members of the Public Assembly Facilities Commission. Um, I I need the screen here. Can you all see my screen here? Yeah. Okay, great. All right, so now we will jump into talking about um, what staff has put together as far as a restricted opening plan. Should we be authorized? Um, and really to help with that whole planning process of operating a fair <clears throat> uh, in what we hope is a downturn of a pandemic, uh, but we obviously can't predict that. So I'll jump through and um, feel free to jump in at any point or save all the questions to the end um, and we'll go from there. And this is the 2020 restricted opening plan for the Carolina Classic Fair. Uh, it is submitted by staff of the Winston-Salem Fairgrounds that the 2020 Carolina Classic Fair, October 2nd through 11th, can reasonably and safely operate conditioned upon and with the expectation that those responsible, including our partners, for planning the fair will conduct in a way that practices enhanced social distancing throughout the fairgrounds, the programming areas, and to impose closures and other safety precaution me uh, precautionary measures throughout the entirety of our operation. Um, so a lot, a lot of what this plan looks like uh, is kind of what we've taken from much of the guidance from CDC, um, from the WHO, from uh, health departments. Uh, a lot of it was based around the Delaware State Fair, which is happening, I, I believe they're opening on Wednesday uh, with a, a, I think it's greater than a two week run. Um, so, you know, we, we leaned on their plan a little bit. We came up with some of our own strategies um, and kind of th this represents what we think uh, should the fair be uh, approved to run, we can, we feel we can have a safe plan in place for those who are within our gates. Uh, and that includes guests, staff, uh, vendors and contractors, anyone who's a part of, of this process. Uh, so here's an overview uh, and each one of these bullet points has a slide to follow that further details um items of implementation and then on top of each of these slides cheryl and i have been working on a more detailed implementation uh in a word document uh we've probably got close to 30 total pages put together which which talks about how we actually implement people wearing masks and what we do if they don't uh and and some of those details that aren't mentioned here this is more of an overview of how we how we see the fair looking, uh, so staff would be required to wear mask and required and required for a health screening. We go completely mobile and touch free ticketing and entry. Uh, limited admission capacity at any one time, uh, as recommended by the governor's office. Um, and in fact, as we go through, we'll talk about we're kind of taking that a step further, uh, which will naturally promote social distancing. Complete touch free security along with that entry process and screening of the public. The majority of indoor facilities will be closed to the public. Public mask would be required in seated and congregated areas uh, along with at the entry. Um, and there's also an option of having mask worn all the time uh, if we need to implement that measure. Decreased and spread out rides to promote natural social distance and less cross traffic. 
further spread out vendors that, that's referring to kind of the food vendors and the entertainers outside um, on the fairgrounds. Uh, we'll be closing the grandstand events and of course an increased cleaning of touch points. Uh, and one thing to note in going through this plan is we really looked at the, the three main things that everyone talks about. It's wearing your mask, washing your hands, sanitizing your hands, and then keeping that social distance. Those are kind of the three things any government agency or any health department or any uh, health experts going to tell you that's going to prevent the spread of this uh, disease or any disease or any sickness. Uh, some additional highlights that we can do, the fair, we can manage and reduce capacity to 50% or greater as needed in order to allow for appropriate social distancing. All of the fair's grounds entertainment will be outdoors for 2020. Any livestock related program programming will be under an open air facility, which is the cattle barn and close to the public with enhanced safety measures for those participating in the show. 100% of our fairgrounds dining occurs outside. The fair's guests will freely move throughout a 70 acre outdoor open air portion of the fairgrounds, promoting social distancing and additional hand washing and sanitizing stations, uh, specifically entry and exit points and concentrated food location. Uh, so jumping into kind of the, the main bullets here, we're looking at staff entertainers, vendors, uh, anyone who's affiliated with the fair, uh, employees, any contractors, they would all be required to wear masks at all times, uh, required to wear gloves as needed based on their job role and duty or as defined by the health department. Uh, we will require anyone who enters the fair gates who's working for the city or contracted through the city to have their temperature checked and to answer health screening questions um, as defined by the, the city of Winston-Salem and the health department. Jumping ahead to ticketing, uh, we have revised our pricing structure uh, slightly to look at $7 in advance, a $10 during the fair. So from October 2nd through 11th, anytime you bought a ticket would be $10. And there would be a $5 early bird. Uh, you naturally increase non peak attendance and to draw people off of those uh, high traffic days, Friday nights and Saturdays. We would look at 100% no touch admission, ticketing, and entry. Uh, this would mean all tickets would need to be purchased via computer or mobile device. Uh, we would eliminate any use of cash transactions amongst fairground staff. Um, but also noting here that cash would still be used by third party vendors within the fair. So our, our food vendors and the, and the games and straights, the, the ride folks would still be using cash. We would just put an extra precaution in for our staff. Uh, for city staff to that because of the relationship we have with Ticketmaster, we have an option to go completely uh, touch-free uh, mobile, and we would not need to interact with any cash or credit cards on site. All tickets would be scanned upon entry with a mobile device, and seniors 65 and over and kids 12 and under would be free uh, and not need an entry ticket. We would still scan them upon entry with a barcode that would be present to, to mark someone entering the ground. Uh, again, going to the entry, it'd be 100% no touch entry. We are able to monitor the number of people on the ground at any given time. So if five <coughs> people walk in with a ticket uh, and three people leave, we know that there's two people on site. We'd be, we'd have designated staff members to scan people. And when I say scan people, I don't mean scan actual individuals. We would scan a barcode that would represent someone leaving the grounds or someone entering the ground. We would have posted health and safety questions similar to the ones we've been using for staff at all entry points. Uh, we have a staff member acknowledge guest responses to those questions prior to entering. Uh, we would look at reducing our number of public gates from six gates to two gates. Um, the public would still enter through the metal detectors um, and we would look to eliminate bag checks unless it was for child or medical needs and we would designate a size. Um, we're looking at like a 14 by 14 size bag uh, only for child and medical needs just to keep the searches easier. We have talked about the clear bag policies that are uh, at facilities throughout the country. 
uh, and talking with ShowPro Security, who does our security, they are comfortable and have training in in looking into bags without touching, uh, and and that size is a comfort. So we feel comfortable not trying to implement an additional uh, burden on the public by forcing them to bring a clear bag. Uh, here's just some entry data we compiled from last year, just to kind of give a uh, a, a standpoint of where we would look at if we operated with a 50% or greater attendance uh, on the grounds at any one point. Last year, our highest attended four hour time frame was 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. on Saturday. We had roughly 19,866 guests on site at that time. Um, and this data represents based on ticket scans and survey data, which represents 39% of fairgoers spend four hours or less. Uh, so this is probably a max number. Uh, so with that being said, if we were to reduce capacity to 50% at any given point of time, we could, we would operate with 8,559 people on the grounds, uh, which happened 56% of the time uh, or less last year. So the other 44% would be impacted slightly as we move forward. Uh, so our proposed layout for the fairgrounds would be uh, two entry points. The purple designations here would be the main entrance, which is attached to the uh, main parking lot. And then the other entry gate would be across the grounds at gate seven, which enters at the midway, uh, where we did the mobile parking last year. And there's also senior services here that may potentially be an option for parking. So we tried to utilize where there'd be parking lots on entry. Uh, some closures of buildings, which we'll get into as we move along here. The Ed building, we would close. The grandstand, we would close. The agricultural building, we would close. The poultry barn would be closed. The, um, this building here is the petting zoo. That would be closed and then uh, uh, home and garden building would be closed along with the two pavilions here for wine and special foods uh, contest. The annex we are proposing to, uh, let's see, the annex we would propo propose to uh, open with vendors inside uh, and we'll get into how we see that happening. Um, and then the farmer's market we would propose to have open along with the cattle barn for just the cattle showing, it would be closed to the public. So again, just referencing those building closures, the education building, home and garden building, the agricultural petting zoo, poultry barn, wine pavilion, the special foods, and the cattle barn would be closed to the public, uh, but open for its shows. So looking at how we would uh, represent open buildings, we would look to open the annex uh, which is our uh, marketplace. Uh, some conversations that have come up since the Fair Planning Committee is possibly open the annex instead of, or the Ed Building instead of annex, which is definitely a possibility. Uh, in any case, we would have one-way foot traffic. We would spread our vendors 12 feet apart. Of course, masks would be required for entry. Um, so that would be the flow in our marketplace building. The farmer's market we propose uh, Keeping on site, usually during the fair, we move the farmer's market to the parking lot, um, which where the fireworks shoot off, which is called the leaf mulch lot. Uh, we've talked with the livestock superintendent. We feel like any livestock shows that would occur, we can house them all in the um, cattle barn, and that would save us a lot of money on changeovers, would keep the farmer's market in, it, in its place on Saturdays, uh, so it would be a natural, um, part of the fair, which would be great uh, with the whole agricultural piece that we like to play in with the fair. Uh, the other good thing about the farmer's market is it's already approved for opening under the current governor order. Uh, all eight garage doors would be open to make it an open air facility. We already have one way traffic through the facility. Uh, we would uh, obviously require mass for entry and then we'd emphasize gourd, squash, pumpkins and watermelon. Uh, as far as uh, products that would be on site and available. The yesterday village exhibits, we would propose to keep those open. There, those are the smaller buildings out here. 
um, where the glass blower is um, and some of the other old timey wood carvers and, and stuff like that, we would uh, ask them to monitor and admit one family at a time to view those exhibits. Uh, and there would be one way in and one way out. A lot of those buildings, I think most of those buildings, if not all of them, have uh, a straight direct cross from the entrance to an exit point. The Midway and Carnival. So a lot of this uh, was uh, based on uh, not only the Delaware State Plan, but from Straits themselves, who just operated the Horry County Fair in Myrtle Beach uh, a couple of weeks ago. And... Um, this is kind of an overview of what it would look like. We would um, re, uh, keep pricing in effect. We would reduce the number of rides on site from 65 to 50, alternating rides across from each other, elimination of rides in high trafficked areas, and elimination of all funhouse inflatables and slides that represent high touch points. Uh, we would ask that those are eliminated. We would. Uh, by reducing these rides, we're able to put 25 feet in between rides, which uh, gives us the opportunity to uh, add queue lines to the side and to behind to keep the walkways on the midway open. Uh, they uh, promised uh, daily sanitation of all rides, including frequent sanitation of touch points for uh, regularly occurring rides. Does someone have a question? Okay. Six foot queue lines, as we mentioned here, uh, that would go out of the walkways and behind the line, uh, behind and to the side of the rides. And then a pro proposed elimination of cut through foot traffic on the oval. I'm gonna jump through just to the traffic they proposed. Uh, this is the cut through they're talking about. We would eliminate all traffic through here and put the ticket booths here for folks to buy tickets. Uh, so that way you almost create more of a, a one-way flow if needed. Uh, along with elimination of kind of high traffic area rides and then some alternating pieces here. Um, but as we talk about that 20 foot uh, gap between rides, the queue lines would look somewhat like this where you could go into the side and behind and then enter there and then also <laughs> the exit out here. Uh, so that's their proposed uh, proposal. We feel pretty comfortable with that, um, especially taking into account if we're already reducing capacity by 50 percent uh, we feel pretty good that the the midway is not going to be a uh, elbow to elbow circumstance as it usually is there, there's going to be a lot of extra spacing out on the midway between the uh, natural social distancing the natural uh, progression of folks not being in the facility and then just folks being spread out throughout the grounds and not just on the midway uh, we think it'll be a, a pretty open atmosphere all throughout our fairgrounds. Bob, yeah, th this is Jim Rose. Go ahead, um, I do have one question related, if I'm understanding it correctly. It's one of these deals where you walk up, turn a corner, walk back. So people are facing each other all the time in that right. queue. I, personally, I would have some concerns about that. I, I don't know whether you could deal with it by running the queue in one direction farther and limiting the number of entrants uh, going into the queue at a given time. I, mean, I don't know how you can fix it, but I'm, I would not be wildly enthusiastic about standing in lines facing people for any length of time. Sure. Yeah, and I appreciate that comment. And I believe that's actually addressed in their plan. And Cheryl, I don't know if you know off the top, but we can get that right down. I know, uh, I, I believe we talked about having six feet for each line. Um, and, then, and then again, the theory is we're not really having lines, so to speak, because of the reduced capacity of the crowds. Um, so people potentially won't be waiting in line. They'll be more flowing, but I do understand that concern. We'll look into that and get something back on that. I mean, maybe just a, a plexiglass barrier or, or um, plastic, you know, plastic sheeting barrier that would run along that line and be about at face level, something like that. 
sure. might be an option. Sure. Yeah, we'll we'll look at how they broke that down in their plan for sure. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Um, I'll jump on to the entertainment here. Uh, this represents the grounds entertainment. Um, we would assign stationary locations for all entertainment. That includes any roaming acts. Uh, historically, our roaming acts would roam around. Uh, think of the one-man band who's going around, and there's a con contingency of a uh, crowd following behind him. We would uh, look for all of our entertainers to kind of stay in one place, and that would help us uh, to be able to mark off those areas for social distancing, whether it's seated or standing, where we could help kind of promote not being shoulder to shoulder without appropriate measures being in place. Uh, but for those areas where we did have seated areas, uh, we would require masks uh, be required in those seated areas. And then we would also ask, as, as we break down in our plan, much like Delaware State Fair has done, is that we ask that you leave space in between your party and the next party to further promote that social distancing. And in all of these entertainment areas, we would uh, provide a security crowd control uh, to, to help monitor and enforce these areas. Uh, the grandstand entertainment under this proposal is to be closed. We just didn't see it appropriate to put 5,000 people uh, side to side in a grandstand uh, for any of those nightly events. So we've gone ahead and offered that as a closure. Uh, as far as the clock tower stage and the yesterday village music, uh, they kind of go together. Any of the benches or the seating that is there um, are really for two to four people, depending on, on the size of the bench that's there. We would make sure those are spaced six feet apart uh, so people could still in, enjoy the live music if they wanted to sit in, in one place at any given time. Um, and then again, we referenced the uh, exhibits in Yesterday Village, uh, one family permit at a time with one-way traffic in and out. Uh, jumping to the food and beverage piece, uh, we would work closely with the uh, Forsyth County Health Department on all of our vendors to require uh, food establishment permits, which they already do, but for any additional guidelines that they wanted to uh, propose forward, we would work with them on making sure those are all uh, adopted uh, consideration of re relocated and spread out vendors to so ensure social distancing and inline queues. So again, as as we know, our food vendors and what vendors are on site, uh, we would we would appropriately space them so that lines aren't crossing into each other and that lines aren't backing into walkways. Um, any food vendor or fair managed seating, excuse me, seating would be disinfected regularly. Uh, so we would uh, work to have uh, a clean team, so to speak, that would disinfect seating as uh, participants or families or guests got up from a seating area to go clean that before the next group sat down. Um, and then we'd work with our food and beverage vendors to have no self-service options where the public is, uh, for instance, self-filling some of their drinks uh, or any kind of buffet-style food pieces. You know, the biggest one that comes to my mind here is moose juice. For those of you who know what moose juice is, you can get any kind of slushy, you can mix it all together and you self-serve it yourself. Uh, we would ask that they, that vendor provides a, a single individual to uh, serve those customers their beverages. Um, and then just going on to further with the food vendors, they would provide separate runners and separate uh, cash handlers so that way, the person dealing with the transactions is not the same person running the food. Uh, that would be a designated person to get to uh, the, the person of public. Uh, and then again, all food and beverage personnel, we would require to wear masks and gloves as required by the health department. Um, and then no self-serving condiments or napkins or anything where, again, the public is multiple folks are sticking their hands into a single location, uh, possibly increasing that spread. Uh, one note here on our competitive entries, uh, we would uh, be closing all of our competitive entries. These are mainly the pieces tied in the education building and the agricultural barn. Um, we would not have a competition this year. We would still encourage the public to have a, a virtual display 
So for those who have worked so hard throughout the year to uh, work on art or collections or whatever it may be for the Carolina Classic Fair, which they do every year, they could still be recognized and noticed by uh, entering their work on a, a virtual portal, so to speak, so the public could still see all the hard work they put into their um, entry. Uh, but with that being said, we would not judge it. Uh, we felt like that would uh, compromise any integrity of any um, of a lot of the competitions, not really being able to feel and touch and see. Um, and then we also have consideration of, of really still sending out the participant ribbons to the junior entries um, that's always a special moment when when the kids get their ribbon for just participating in the art, the artwork or, or whatever it is they may have entered. So I, I think that's something we still would want to do uh, for those that did submit it virtually. Uh, we've gone ahead and already canceled our wine competition that was supposed to occur in mid August. Um, we talked with our wine, uh, the wineries and some of the the wine uh, judges, and they we. We came to the decision that it was best to close at this time, not knowing the future uh, of October. Uh, the same thing goes with the flower, home and garden show uh, in the home and garden building. Those shows will be closed as well. Uh, looking at the restrooms, which would be considered an indoor area, uh, we would staff those all with an attendant. Anyone who enters the restroom, including that attendant, would be required to wear masks. Uh, we would prop all doors open, not just to the restrooms, but all of our facilities so that any guest or staff would not have to uh, touch any door handles or any entry points. And then that attendant who's in the restroom would uh, sanitize those touch points often. And then for those of you who have been maybe to some of the food booths in the past, the food booth restrooms, there have been attendants in those uh, areas that that will essentially turn the sink on for you, they'll squirt the soap in your hand, they'll give you the paper towel, uh, so you have a complete touch-free um, uh, experience when entering our restrooms. That's something we're looking into to see if we can get attendance, uh, enough attendance and the same folks who have done that previously to do it again. Um, that's something that we think would be very uh, helpful uh, and encouraging for the, the public as they come into our facility. Just some other miscellaneous points as we go through. Uh, we'd work with Straits and some of our uh, other vendors who live on site during those two weeks of the fair uh, and reconfiguring those uh, parking gaps. Uh, any campers would be required to wear face masks when entering the bathhouses and any restroom facilities kind of back a house. And then just increasing the awareness to the Straits team and those who kind of run that area uh, to make sure that, that we are all on the same page and that their, their staff is taking uh, this as serious as we all are to keep all of our employees and guests safe. Uh, we would talk about specific touch points uh, to the public, uh, to the media that they could then <laughs> um, in their media messaging, things like you can't buy your tickets on site with cash, uh, you have to buy them in advance. Um, what they can expect from a safety standpoint, uh, capacity limitations, all those things would be uh, bullet points that would be provided to the media for them to relay to the public. Uh, so that way we have a good expectation when the public arrives. Uh, we would have signage everywhere you turn, the, the plan would be to create some kind of plan. So anywhere you're at on the fairgrounds, that may be a congregating point, you're constantly reminded uh, to wash your hands, to sanitize your hands, to wear your mask, and to keep social distancing between the parties uh, that are not related to yours. Uh, with all that being said, our target on sale date and announcement uh, as as a as a fair staff, a fairground staff, we we would not be able to proceed comfortably after August 18th to be able to fortify uh, the equipment, the materials, the staffing. Uh, the advertising, everything we felt would be needed to produce a, a fair in this manner, we, we would need to know by August 18th if we were going to proceed or not uh, at an absolute latest. Um, and that's about two weeks later than our normal on sale date. Um, so again, with all of these 
uh, laid out items. We do expect a natural attrition uh, to facilitate social distancing with an extended layout with all of our guests, our vendors, and entertainers. Uh, some other considerations we've talked about considering would be one-way traffic all throughout the grounds. Um, we don't feel with the reduced capacities and the natural attrition that we would need that. We think our walkways are wide enough to, to promote uh, distance. And, um, and then we look at, uh, if needed, we could have masks required for entry and 100% of the time for the public and staff while they're on site. Um, another part here we've talked about is getting sponsors for still hosting our junior livestock competition. So as we talked about the cattle barn being close to the public, we would still offer the junior livestock shows uh, for those kids who work all year to raise their uh, animals um, and, and kind of supporting that we would need sponsors with the expectation that we'd have a reduced gate uh, and that gate that gate is what usually supports that financial piece. So uh, we feel pretty good about some of the sponsors we, we've reached out to so far that we'd be able to supplement that uh, and have no loss of, uh, no decrease in overall revenues between that, that specific competition. Uh, and then just looking at parking, uh, we're, we're looking and aware that we can do some complete mobile parking, uh, sorry, mobile parking with ticketing that, that we've done in the past, just like last year we had uh, with fan park and the advanced options. Uh, we feel like we can do that again. Uh, it's just a matter of implementation uh, and, and making the public aware of parking, which is a little bit more challenging than uh, the ticketing piece. Uh, so overall, just a refresher on the budget. Um, so we look at uh, what was our original adopted budget from last year, 2020, to what was going, what was pr proposed uh, and adopted, I believe last month or a couple months ago uh, by the Fair Planning Committee and you all in council. We have, with this plan, we have gone ahead and made a restricted budget, which represents how we think the expenses would line up more appropriately and uh, represent a decreased attendance by about 50%. Um, and in looking at that, uh, compared to the adopted budget, it's fairly even. We would see about $20,000 less in revenues, uh, assuming a 50% reduction in attendance. Uh, and with the proposed closures um, and other items that, that would call, account for savings here. And some of those highlights under this plan would be $75,000 less in advertising, $125,000 less in entertainment. A lot of that is in that grandstand piece. 80,000 less in personnel, uh, and this really falls into line with the folks who would be in some of those entry buildings. Um, the additional security that, that was needed for seven, six total gates uh, with the metal detectors, uh, $100,000 in premiums. Again, this ties back to uh, our entry system and those who entered and were awarded prize money. And then uh, we would look see uh, about $50,000 in security savings. Uh, overall. Uh, and with that being said, so while security is cut at the gates specifically, those four gates, uh, at this time, the Winsam Pol Police Department, um, they are fully staffed uh, and ready and committed to staff, how they staff a full 100% capacity fare. So there would be no decrease at this time uh, from the Winston Salem Police Department uh, in the conversations I've had uh, with their officials. Uh, and then just to share with you some of the feedback from the Fair Planning Committee last week, 45% um, of original proposed budget revenues would equal a break-even budget under this opening. Uh, so essentially what's that saying is if we had 45% 40 of the attendance uh, last year, that would be our break-even number to get to a zero-based budget. Um, and I, I know Stephen's on here. If you guys have questions on that, he can probably... Uh, break it down a little better than I. Um, the As we talked about the question to implement a clear bag policy, uh, we as a staff don't feel like we need to do that uh, based on the security staff's training uh, and what we can do uh, with the 14 by 14 bags. 
Uh, and then just they talked about the public mask enforcement uh, and crowd control locations. So we've gone along further and kind of implemented how we would. Uh, we've probably got a 12 page document right now going and it, it does address all of this and how we would uh, approach someone in the public if they weren't wearing their mask in a, a designated area and, and the things we would do to support that um, and ultimately escort someone out of the facility if they were not willing to comply. Uh, so again, this would be uh, to keep public mask enforcement strong. We would have crowd control locations at all entry points, any high congregated areas, any seated areas. And then again, referencing the, ro the roaming WSPD uh, full staff. Um, as we have in years past. We would also ask that our vendors and entertainers constantly remind guests who are watching their show to keep their mask on while they're entertaining uh, or before they're serving. We would have regular uh, signage throughout the grounds as we talked about and then public address announcements from the clock tower regularly. Uh, we, we also talked about we would not provide masks at the gates uh, for sale by our staff, but we would consider a third party seller um, as an option to uh, operate that piece. If masks are required, there would be no medical, exe no medical exemptions. And part of this piece is if we're requiring everyone to have a mask on the grounds, we want everyone to have a mask on the grounds for a reason. If, if there's a reason you can't wear it for medical uh, reasons, you should probably not be, uh, unfortunately, at the fairgrounds on uh, during the fair. So, uh, and again, uh, I will say some of this, we did uh, look at other plans that were in place at entertainment facilities, uh, especially Disney. Disney's doing that same thing. Uh, and we feel comfortable with um, doing that. It just, it just makes it cleaner for staff and security to monitor. Uh, and again, just overall, we'll notify patrons to wear their masks if they don't comply. Uh, we would ask them to be escorted out by a member of uh, the Winston-Salem Police Department. And then I believe finally, uh, we would close each night as we always do with our grand fireworks show that is still budgeted um, and one of the best parts of the fair nightly. And uh, with that, that is the end of this presentation. Well, Bob, let me be the first to congratulate all the people that were involved in making this plan because uh, I think it's very thorough and it looks like it's been carefully thought through. Um, anyway, I, I think you've done a good job. Thank you, Jim. Are there any other specific questions we can address? Um, and again, I just want to preface that was more of an overview. We probably, Cheryl and I have another 20 pages and really detail each of those items along with the straits plan. Um, and to Jim's note earlier, we'll get back uh, with everyone on the six foot few lines that kind of go back and forth. And Cheryl, I don't know if there's anything you want to add right now. Um, not at this time. Um, I've been keeping in close contact with Straits and what they are doing. Um, like you previously said, they were in Myrtle Beach over the 4th. Um, I think everything went well for them down there, aside from weather and just reduced attendance. Um, there were no other issues. Um, and I'm keeping them updated. They're keeping me updated. And any questions that y'all may have, I can easily um, pass those along. I have a question. Yes. In, in, in the event that we do cancel the fair, would we uh, continue to do the drive-in theater? Yeah, Billy, there is a potential option for that. So right now, uh, the individual who rented out the drive-in theater, his contract runs through September 15th. Um, and we, there have already been discussions if the fair is canceled and depending on what the overall state of the, the, the state is as far as hosting indoor events again, uh, we would definitely consider extending that into November. Uh, we've, all, we've also had discussions with uh, other vendors that may be interested in 
some kind of other type of drive-in uh, carnival food kind of uh, or concerts, some other things we can get creative in doing. Uh, but as of now, uh, you know, we, we will, we're, we're remaining closed as a facility, um, but there is certainly potential for the drive-in to continue. Hey, this is Otis. Said, um, a question, and then uh, I guess another question. But what were the ticket prices last year? So I can have a reference point for what the new re prices are. So the ticket prices are, are really similar. Uh, they were still $10 on the, the weekends, and I believe they were still $7 in advance. The biggest difference is uh, the kids' price was five and under were free, uh, and then there was actually a kids' price. So we've eliminated the kids' price and extended the kids' age to 12 and under. Uh, so really in an effort to make it easier for the public to just go online and buy one ticket price instead of trying to buy two at this price and two at that price. Uh, so, so the only, the main, main difference is that, that kids piece, the early bird admission is still the same. The outline still the same. The advanced sale price, uh, I believe is still the same. Uh, it's really that kids piece and that's really to make it a user friendly experience, uh, during the, 100% mobile uh, process that we're trying to implement. If would somebody be, thank you. Would would someone who showed up at the ticket, despite all the communication they've been given, still shows up with no ticket? Would they be able to use their phone, go on the app, buy the ticket, and then enter? Yes. Yeah. So that that is uh, okay. the benefit of what. They could do, they could A, either go onto the Ticketmaster app um, and just buy it straight through the app. If they have a mobile Internet Explorer or Safari, they could just go through Ticketmaster.com uh, and purchase it. And it will uh, either sure. text, text or email a ticket straight to their phone uh, Perfect. so that they can walk right in. And we'll have we'll still have a ticket staff member out there to kind of help walk people yeah. through that process. Uh, the, the big difference is we won't really be exchanging any credit cards or cash. We'll be like, uh, the, here's how you can go on your phone. Here's how you can do it. Um, and we'll probably right. have signage as well that kind of direct folks to, to that process. Okay, and, and I'll ask one more and then I'll give the floor back to folks. So you're talking about the number of people who were at the fair at a certain time last year, and then you know, 50%, and, and I think that that's right. I mean, I think you also need to consider and just be ready if somebody raises a, a concern of, well, yeah, but that number that you're talking about, cutting 50%, 5,000 of those folks were in the grandstand. They weren't out on the open areas walking around, so you're really not cutting the walking area down I think I think what you've done and the, the thought process through it is is supportable and but I would I would see somebody saying that well you've closed all these indoor places that's where the people were I <laughs> perhaps and so you're really actually going to be more crowded um, I could see someone making a, a comment like that but but I'm I think we should you know continue with the process of trying to have the fair for the community uh, if if at all possible, if we can do it safely, and, and I appreciate y'all's work on this. But my, my last question, again, on the ticket piece of it, is will we have a cutoff on a certain date for ticket sales? And if so, is there some type, some thought of some running total of, well, there's 8,000 tickets available for uh, the fit, and we've sold 7,500 tickets or 500 tickets available for the fifth. Yeah, so I'll, I'll speak to both of those. Uh, so, you know, we, we understood that same piece you talked about with the grandstand being closed or the annex or the education building being closed, which is why we really took that four hour window. Um, so we took the max of the whole four hour period knowing even that's 39% of, of people spend 
four hours or less. So knowing people aren't spending all four of those hours in the grandstand or any specific building, it, it already accounts for those people rotating in and out of those buildings. Um, and that's yeah, also okay. assuming all of those people stay for four hours, which we know, we know from the survey data, you know, a lot of people are two hours at a time, uh, three hours at a time. So we, we feel really comfortable with that as a extreme max, uh, which is um, a comfortable number for us. And then going to the um, ticketing piece, we, we would not, so there would be no way to monitor the per day. So you're saying 8,000 people, we couldn't just put 8,000 tickets for sale for the whole day because we'd be monitoring at any given time. Um, so we would have a, an open ticket system where you could buy for that day. So for example, if we sold 20,000 tickets for a, a Friday, that's not saying all 20,000 of those people come within that one time frame. So um, there, there may be potential where we have to tell people to wait to enter. I don't think we get to that point, um, but it certainly is something to, to think about on a Friday or Saturday night at five o'clock. Um, and we've got 10,000 people waiting to get in or, or, or 2,000 people waiting to get in. I, I think um, yeah. that's the piece we'll have to work, work through. Um, and I, so I appreciate that feedback. Yeah, that, that's the, because you said there's two entrances. How many exits are there? So you could you monitor still, so you can keep up with who's leaving. Yeah, you would still be able to exit uh, through any of the original turnstile gates if you needed to. Uh, so for emergency purposes, the other exit gates would still be manned by a secure, a crowd control manager. Uh, so in the event of an emergency, there would, could still be an emergency exit piece. But the theory is everyone is exiting the same way they entered um, because their cars are in those locations. So we would, um, we would have to definitely work if someone decided to exit out of some random gate along 27th Street, that crowd control person would have to uh, provide some kind of notification to our ticket uh, scanning folks. Uh, but, but we would hope that 99% of folks would enter the way they, or exit the way they entered as that's where their vehicles are parked. That's a great question as well. Thank Thanks. you. Buddy. Are there any further questions for Robert? Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Cheryl, for putting all that together. We really appreciate you doing that. It's very, very thorough. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on to staff updates. Um, keeping in mind, too, guys, that we're getting close to the one o'clock hour, so I do want to respect everybody's time and not hold everybody too far over. But if we could um, go through the staff updates quickly, thank you. We'll, and we'll start with the Winston Salem Fairgrounds again. Thank you. I'll just go through that real quick. Um, so, with the latest governor's announcement, as we talked about earlier, we are remaining closed all of our indoor facilities um, and specifically any other events not approved by the governor's um, mandate. Uh, we're closed through August 7th. Uh, for the most part, we have gone ahead and canceled all of our events through September 15th that were scheduled, which leads us right up into our fair window uh, that we normally have uh, outlined for the fair. Um, but with that being said, all we have operating right now is the farmer's market, uh, which has been doing really well on Saturday mornings. And then, uh, we have opened the drive-in movie theater out on the midway, which has the double screens. It just completed its second week and it has been going really well. We have had a total of 3,600 people, I believe, uh, view movies in the 10 days that it's been on site. Uh, so there's definitely an upward trend. Um, and and uh, I think all of our staff and everyone's doing a great job at really uh, keeping the measures uh, in place for safety and um, 
we're excited that we have the opportunity to present such a thing here. And uh, as Billy said, if the fair does not happen, we're excited to look to continuing it, you know, through November. Thank you for that. Can we move on to Bowman Gray? Okay, I'll uh, take that one. So just uh, let you all know that I think we've very close to having final design completed. Uh, we're in what's called the design development phase and uh, architects are actually working on construction drawings. And so our plan is to bring to you all next month a uh, presentation on the project and probably an item to recommend uh, awarding the contract for construction. Again, we're using the construction manager at risk method. So we're already working with uh, the uh, general contractor on, on uh, estimating what was called the guaranteed maximum price for the construction uh, of the project. And so we'll be bringing that to you all in August so you can make a recommendation to the council. So hopefully we can have uh, the, the contract approved by council in September. And our hope is that we can actually start work in October. Now that we know that there will be no racing uh, and there will be no football uh, this year, we really want to take this up, get started as, as soon as we can. Uh, and we're thinking that October could be the time that we could start. <clears throat> we wouldn't be able to complete the project before the start yeah. of, of the 2021 season, but we, but I think the contractor in the first phase is looking <coughs> to construct one of the rest, new restroom facilities by the start of the racing season in, in uh, April of 2021. So, uh, so we're we wanting to be uh, as aggressive as we can be uh, to get started on the project so we can uh, start getting these investments, uh, you know, built. Perfect. Thank you, Ben. Carolina Classic Fair facility branding. I'll take care of that one. Um, as you can see, um, our branding is proceeding very well. Um, if Meredith, if you could put up the grandstand PDF, please. This is our most recent um, completion of the grandstand painting that turned out very well. The blue pops and the vinyl um, logo looks really great. We are also in the process of rebranding our gates, the main gate, which uh, faces the Coliseum parking lot. Those, that um, new design should be completed by the end of this month, along with the additional lettering at gate seven, which is on shore fair. That's going to be um, changed over also. Um, we've rewrapped our ticket booths, our portable ticket booths that sit out front. Uh, the cattle barn, you've already, um, we presented that, I think, in a previous meeting. Um, that project was done, and I think, um, and along with the farmer's market mural, that project was also done. Does anyone have any questions about the branding? Thank you, Cheryl. The Benton. I believe Grant may have uh, had to sign off. He had a one o'clock meeting, but I would just share with you a couple things real quick. I mean, the Benton remains closed um, for the, the, the phase that we're in right now. Uh, we are holding some uh, city point of board and commission meetings up there because the ballrooms you know, allow for great social distancing. And, uh, and so we are uh, utilizing some of our space for, for city business. Um, I will share with you that uh, Lisa and I received the report on the, on the uh, financials for 1920. And uh, I have to say it's extraordinary. Uh, you know, the Benton has not held an event in that building since March 7th. And they're actually going to come in under budget, slightly under budget on the subsidy from the city uh, for 1920. That tells you how good the Benton was doing up until the pandemic uh, hit us. Uh, they were they were probably on track to to uh, you know maybe even hit another uh, high for for them uh, for for that building. And so with that with that you know cushioning our our uh, the, the the pandemic, we were able to stay within budget. I would say too that they also took extraordinary measures, in my view, to control expenses. I mean, really, right now there are only two employees up there. Grant and an engineer. And so uh, I, I give a lot of credit to Hospitality Ventures Management Group, our operator, for how they very, moved very quickly to uh, 
develop an expense control plan to be able to weather weather this. So, uh, so I mean, just really very feel very fortunate about how we ended 1920. You know, 2021 we're monitoring very closely. Uh, uh, they the budget for the Benton for 2021 included you know, not quite seven hundred thousand dollars in revenue in the first half of the year. We already know that that you know we're probably not going to have anything this month. Uh, and 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 uh, and most likely in August and probably in the foreseeable future. So uh, so while we may be seeing you know revenue losses that we had originally budgeted for, we we were very conservative with the budget. So we f we still feel like that uh, we'll be able to keep everything managed. And of course, I mean the uh, HVMG will continue to manage expenses very closely uh, as as long as the, the billing remains closed. Awesome. Thank you for that, Ben. And then lastly, the farmer's market. Robert, Carol? Yeah, I can take that. Um, the farmer's market, like Robert said earlier, um, seems to be doing very well. Willie is reporting very good attendance. Um, we are constantly um, reminding everyone to wear your mask and making sure the vendors also remember to wear their mask. Um, I don't know if any of you had a, had a, have had a chance to visit the market, but it has been very busy. Um, people are respecting, for the most part, you know, the social distancing and the mask requirements. So overall, I think it's been, we've been very fortunate in order to keep that facility open for the, for the public. Excellent. Thank you, Cheryl, for that. You're welcome. Thank you, staff, for all the updates today. Commission, are there any further questions for the for the city staff? Hearing hey, none. Hey, so, I, I just I would just say, you know, because this is was such a, an important you know, meeting in terms of the top main topic, and we <laughs> certainly will inform you all. Uh, there, inform you all before. Uh, and we make any public announcement regarding the fair. Uh, one, we will definitely keep you all informed about uh, discussions that are going on with management and council. Thank you for that, Ben. We, we definitely appreciate that. Thank you. And if there be no further questions, we will adjourn this meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.